Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSAS. Um, on behalf of our co-organizer, the CSAS Human Rights Initiative, I want to thank everyone for taking some time out today and joining us for uh, what I think is going to be an excellent and important conversation on the topic of human rights abuses in Xinjiang. What's worked, what hasn't, what's next? Um, as we sit here in the, the eve of a new administration coming in, I think there's an important opportunity for a recalibration, a, a reset here in the United States and around the world on how we address this extraordinarily important but vexing challenge of um, the widespread human rights abuses and repression in Xinjiang. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. In a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Amy Lear, who is going to introduce um, some of the work that her program has been doing, in, including um, a report which should be out, I'm, I'm told, any moment on the CSIS uh, website. So I'll, I'll give Amy um, the mic and she can explore what that report says and what the implications are. And then we'll come back for a roundtable discussion with, with three just, just unparalleled guests here to help us um, wade through this thicket of challenging issues. Uh, I'm really excited to have uh, Sheena Greitens, who's an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, Maga Rajagopalan, who's the international correspondent for BuzzFeed News, uh, and Jessica Batke, who's a senior editor uh, for China File. Uh, so given the limitations on time here and all the uh, issues we're gonna have to get through, I want to immediately turn it over to Amy. Just wanna say for folks watching um, who wanna pose a question, you can put that into the chat function. Um, I'm gonna monitor the questions. Obviously we've, we've got a real limitation on time here, but hopefully we can carve out some space uh, for you to pose questions to any of our guests today, as well as, as Amy. Uh, so with that, Amy, I'm gonna turn it uh, over to you. Thanks so much, Jude. And I will try to keep my talking point short enough that we can hear from this really fantastic panel. Um, my program has been working on the issue of human rights abuses in Xinjiang for over a year. And we focus particularly on the problem of forced labor, but also more broadly. So I'm going to quickly describe some of that work to date, and I'll put up links to all the different reports and briefs we've put out, at least most of them. Um, and then I'll focus on the report that we've launched today, which I believe is now up. So just briefly, in 2019, we issued a report on the scope and forms of forced labor in Xinjiang, and it had a lot of recommendations for the US government and for companies about what they could do. In 2020 and forthcoming in early 2021, We'll have four reports and a podcast coming out. So it's been a busy, busy year. Um, one of those is really focused on what is produced in Xinjiang and how those tie to global supply chains and the risk of forced labor there with a really deep dive into the textile and apparel sector. The next one looked at supply, supply chain transparency. Uh, most companies don't know where their stuff comes from, from about beyond tier one. Um, so what are the opportunities to improve that? Uh, because that has a huge impact on the ability of a company to make sure that their products aren't linked to these kinds of abuses. We have upcoming guidance on what governments and companies can do to diversify their supply chain. Um, when those supply chains really have these deep, deep links to Xinjiang. Um, and so really shifting supply chains in a meaningful way is really hard. Um, to really move the whole supply chain out of a place like China that's so important. And it will take really purposeful action by governments to accomplish that, or it'll take a very long time. And then there's a report we launched today. So this is a little bit different in tone, less focused on supply chains, although I'll still talk about that some. We also, in the course of all this research, talked to a lot of experts from different backgrounds, trying to understand what's actually going to affect China's decision making. Um, and those were somewhat frustrating conversations because there's clearly no silver bullet, like one thing you do that's gonna cause China to change direction. Um, and I think a recurring theme was that the actions being taken in Xinjiang are 
because of a priority on maintaining maintaining stability, addressing what is perceived to be a terrorist threat. Um, and it's going to be really, really hard to change that calculation and that some economic pain, for example, will likely just be tolerated. I also am of the view that I, the measures to date have not necessarily really affected the Chinese government's actions in Xinjiang, uh, although it's affected how they talk about it publicly, at least in English. And I do want to just flag the fact that I'm, I think this panel, as well as my remarks are focusing on what's effective. There are policy actions that can be taken because it's morally the right thing to do, and, and that has its own value. So I don't want to um, ignore that. But, but again, we also want them to be effective in terms of creating results. So that's more my focus. And I think, you know, we pointed, and I'll get to them, to a lot of different um, policy tools that could be used um, and that we think urgently need to be tried. But uh, there is sort of a theme that I think we need to talk about, which is that past performance is no guarantee of future results. So just because something worked in the past, which we point out in the report, doesn't mean it's going to be effective in this context. So that's one of the really frustrating aspects of this problem. The situation is somewhat unique to the past. China is first a lot more geo geopolitically important, let's say, than apartheid South Africa. They've been, able, they've been able to shoehorn Muslim majority countries into supporting what they're doing in Xinjiang publicly. And the level of economic integration today and China's importance in it looks really different from, let's say, the Cold War. So. This both creates an opportunity to influence China and really profound opportunities for China to retaliate, which we're starting to see, um, including related to criticisms about human rights. We really focused on the need for multi a multilateral and multifaceted effort in the report. I think that's like the overarching theme um, and that there does need to be action by more actors than just the US government and little bit of piecemeal bits other places. So we tried to create some buckets. One of those was sort of looking at economic tools and supply chains. And there you see options like import restrictions. Those can take different forms. The US has a really um, powerful tool, the Tariff Act of 1930, where in principle, Customs and Border Protection can seize any goods produced with forced labor anywhere in the supply chain. Congress is considering creating a presumption that everything from Xinjiang is produced with forced labor. Um, Enforcement is challenging, really challenging when these supply chains are so opaque and there's very few people at CBP enforcing this particular rule. Uh, but you know, the UK and EU, well, the UK has a similar law. So that is a potential tool. And then in the EU where they don't have these kinds of laws necessarily, they are going to create a mandatory human rights due diligence requirement in the next year or so. And they could produce Xinjiang specific guidance for companies about what are they expected to do in their own due diligence and responses to Xinjiang abuses. Um, or they could focus on government-sponsored forced labor if they don't want to call out Xinjiang specifically. Companies, of course, could act on these sort of supply chain issues themselves, but it's been, they haven't been public when they have acted for the most part on Xinjiang because they're concerned about retaliation. I just want to flag a little bit of thinking about effectiveness of these, these efforts. Um, and again, you know, whether or not they're effective, there may be moral reasons for doing them anyway. But um, on the one hand, yarn textile and apparel are, you know, China's the largest producer of them in the world by far. Um, and they were 10% of the value of total Chinese exports in 2018. So it's an important part of their, the economy. Um, but I just wanna share an image because I think this works a little bit better that way. Bear with me. So you can see here basically that if you combined not just the US, but the EU, UK, and Japan, it's around half of the um, market for Chinese textile and apparel exports. So if you got beyond just the US and you managed to get some EU countries to start taking action, the UK, Japan, then you start to get to some real money and impact potentially. Um, but you know, if the US does this on its own, we'll see, we'll see how much pain the CCP is willing to bear on this, right? Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. 
Um, another just piece of the economic puzzle, again, that just we need to bear in mind is that when we really looked at, this was surprising to me, China actually, it, 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 it itself purchases internally 88% of its tech textiles and apparel. So there's a huge internal market. And so one of the arguments you'll hear is that if you put it like basically a ban on exports, it'll go partly to other countries where it might sell for less money and it'll go into this internal market. Um, so, so there are opportunities there, but I think it's not clear cut that that particular tool is going to just like fix this problem. And I think other examples I can think of from history suggest it won't. The other topics that the report touched on, and I want to be pretty quick because I have about two minutes, um, are sanctions. So just all the research on sanctions indicates that multilateral sanctions are much, much more effective than unilateral sanctions. So far, the US has pretty much been going this alone. Um, and, and we won't get UN sanctions because China's on the Security Council at the UN. Uh, we probably won't get EU sanctions because I believe that's a foreign policy decision and you'd need un unanimity. But there are countries like Canada, the UK, and others that have laws that can be easily be used um, in this situation. So that is, I think, if, if sanctions are the tool of choice, then that multilateralism is really important. Um, diplomacy, obviously, this should be in talking points for any government that cares about this with all their high level meetings with the Chinese government. And it should definitely be part of US trade talks. It's never made any sense to bifurcate them from trade talks and then use trade tools to try to go after the human rights challenges. I think one other kind of untapped approach is a more bottom up, up way of thinking about this, which is that if we really want Muslim countries to speak out and they might be a more important voice, frankly, than the US in certain ways, um, because they can't be accused of being imperialists as easily. Um, having foundations, governments, NGOs supporting journalists and NGOs in Muslim majority countries, like let's say Indonesia or Thailand, I think that could be a way of forcing government officials to start taking on this issue. Um, and last, I think this question of coalitions is a really important one. Um, the EU is going to struggle to act on this because of the foreign policy aspect of it. The G7 is a possibility, but maybe it's that we really need new ad hoc coalitions. And I think, and I don't have the answer to how to do this, but thinking about how to jointly protect each other against, against retaliation um, will be really important for getting our European allies and others to join those. And that re brings me to this panel, which I'm hoping has all the answers to these very thorny issues. Thanks so much. Great, thank you very much, Amy. I wonder, um, Amy, if I can have you linger for one second, maybe I just take uh, moderator's prerogative and just ask you, as, you're, um, as you've been writing and working on this report, um, what, what are some of the near and end states or, or visions of victory that, that you're thinking of? I think it's one of the, um, this problem is so big and so multifaceted, um, just in terms of your discussions and your own thinking, um, we're taking actions to what end? And of course, I realize the ultimate end is, as you say in the report, the, the full dismantling of an apartheid-like system. But do you have any more way stations or, or, um, uh, or, or sort of near-term goals that you see as practical? I mean, some critical pieces. I, I do think, okay, everything being relative, that forced labor is slightly more hanging, like low-hanging fruit where we have more tools to try to get at the problem. So that's one where I would hope maybe we would see some progress sooner. Um, and then, you know, but, but one thing I point out in the report is that to know that there's no forced labor, you really need access. Um, and so there has to be more access. I mean, same for like having the UN have meaningful access. They've asked for it and they haven't been given it. Um, they haven't been given free and unfettered access that would allow them to do their job. Um, and so I think, you know, the first things maybe we'd see are some kind of slowing down or ending of the system of forced labor, more access to the region, a lightening maybe of the surveillance state. Um, you know, I think also some of the actions around like reproductive status are pretty appalling. Um, and then, you know, I think maybe Mika will have thoughts on um, just the level of detention, but you know, that one may actually be harder to make progress on, but we can talk about that. Great. 
Thank you very much, Amy. And, and um, you know, Amy, would like to come back to you at the end of the discussion for some summing up thoughts. Um, so uh, um, for the next portion of this, um, I'm really excited to now have a, a roundtable discussion on three experts on China's domestic political system and, and on the ongoing issues um, in, in Xinjiang. Um, Amy has just mentioned some of the actions that have been taken by the United States and, and, and the UK most prominently. I saw that just this morning we saw Foreign Minister Nigel Adams in the UK telling, reaffirming to Parliament that um, that the UK government sees evidence of forced labor within Xinjiang as being credible. Um, of course, we saw it in, in December 2nd, the US Customs and Border Protection, as Amy mentioned, announcing a ban on cotton and cotton products that originated from the Xinjiang Production Construction Corps, XBCC. That, of course, follows on the heels of uh, sanctioning of XBCC, as, as well as sanctioning of the um, uh, uh, party secretary, uh, Chen Chuenguo. Um, in June, we saw President Trump sign the, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, which mandates some stepped up uh, reporting by the US government, the intel agencies, FBI, State Department. And of course, now there's the bill currently being discussed in Congress uh, on the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. But really where I wanted to fo focus this discussion is, okay, we see some of the tools being created. We see the, the, the increased use of sanctions. Um, Amy talked about the need to forge some new tools, but um, with the three guests we have here, I, I wanted to discuss more importantly, what do we think will move the needle given the political and domestic exigencies in China, the governing vision of the current Xi Jinping administration. Um, I don't know if all of you saw David Rennie's most recent Chaguan column in The Economist. He, he and another journalist had uh, trekked out to one of the production facilities that the US government has tried to target or shut down, uh, found it still running. And the, the concluding line of his piece is, China's regime is so secretive because it, because it has no patience for debating its policies with foreigners. It is proud of its iron-fisted rule in Xinjiang and is not about to change. So I hope we can uh, put that thesis to a test here. Um, obviously, David is is outlining quite a pessimistic vision. Um, so with, without further ado, I wanted to start with a question for Mega, which is, I hope as everyone at this point uh, watching has already rushed out to read um, her co-authored fantastic and I think really path-breaking piece doing some uh, forensics accounting and, and uh, architectural reconstruction of a detention camp. Um, I wanted to make a turn to you to ask, it's 2020, we've now seen four years of, of really sustained pressure here. We've seen the Chinese government go from a position of saying camps, what camps, to oh sure, yes, but they're re-education, to uh, uh, more implausibly Yes, but everyone has been released. What is, in your estimation or your analysis, what is the current state right now in Xinjiang? Has the needle shifted at all in one way or the other, either towards more repression or towards less, um, in the face of, of uh, some of this external pressure? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting time to be writing about this because a lot actually has changed in those last four years. It's interesting that you bring up these kind of changing statements. We started working on this project where we were trying to essentially locate all of the camps. That's what we wanted to do. Um, and uh, we wanted to figure out how many there were and where they were in the region and these kind of like fundamental things that we still didn't really know about. And then at the end of last year, the governor of Xinjiang, who is the, the second from the top official under the party boss um, said, uh, everyone's graduated. Um, and of course, you're not gonna accept this you know, fully, but um, I think a lot of people, including myself reading between the lines might have thought, you know, there's so much international pressure on this. And perhaps this is an indication that they're either pulling back from this or they're moving to some other type of policy that looks a little bit different, but is, is probably still repressive um, towards Uyghurs and Kazakhs and other Muslim minorities. Um, so when we embarked on this project, that's sort of what I expected to find. I thought perhaps like this camp system was changing in some fundamental way. And in fact, we found the opposite. What we found was that um, in the first kind of two years of this program, the government was moving very, very quickly to incarcerate like um, or detain like just a, a lot of people um, at once. I interviewed former detainees who were talking about these scenes of getting to these camp gates in the middle of the night and they would just have the clothes that they brought and there would be like dozens, 
dozens of people. Like sometimes there would be people with children who were being separated from their children. Um, you know, people being separated to go into by gender to go into different security queues. It just sounded like absolute chaos. And then of course they would talk about you know the lack of food, the fact that it was desperately overcrowded. And it turns out the reason one of the reasons for this is that in the first couple of years of the program, the government was using a lot of like repurposed public buildings, like schools and old folks' homes and stuff like that. Buildings that were kind of dressed up with security features like barbed wire and um, uh, watchtowers and stuff like that, but weren't actually meant to be prisons. But what we found um, using satellite imagery research is that um, kind of in the past couple of years, since about 2018, um, the government has embarked on this like huge construction spree. And we located some 264, I think above 260 camps um, that are, we believe are still functioning based on recent satellite images. And a lot of those are um, newly constructed, purpose-built, high security facilities. And among the newer facilities, uh, we found at least uh, three that can hold more than 10,000 people. And we found one um, out in a town called Dabancheng outside Urumqi that can hold more than 30,000 people. So in principle, you don't build places like this unless you want to detain people for a long, long time, right? You want to have the ability at least to do that. So there are a few ways to read this. I mean, one is that the detention program is, is in a phase of you know, continuation or expansion. Another is that this is a pool of people that can be used for forced labor in um, not all of the compounds, but many of them, about half of them, we have found uh, factory buildings. Um, and, you know, if, if these buildings are within a compound, it's a strong indication um, of the ability of these buildings to be used for forced labor. And I think a third possible reading is that uh, we're moving from a phase of where people where a lot of people were being arrested for like or sorry detained for pretty like low level offenses things like having WhatsApp on their phone or having like you know an image file that is considered suspicious because it has some connection to um, Middle Eastern culture or Islam or something like that. Um, we're moving from punishing people for doing those sorts of things to focusing on like so called uh, you know like high, higher level criminals. And um, we found this in interviews as well by interviewing people about the, the different ways they were treated based on what they supposedly had done. Um, but if, if it does turn out that they're focusing on um, people with these kinds of offenses, you know, people who are, you know, possibly political dissidents may have been trained as imams, maybe outwardly religious people, all sorts of things like that. Um, it suggests that they're then moving into a system where they're, they're sentencing people instead of arbitrarily detaining them. I think um, from an international uh, perspective, that's quite interesting because it's a lot easier to make the argument that arbitrarily detaining people based on their ethnicity is, is wrong and a violation of international law versus saying um, people who have been through a sentencing process, even if it's like, you know, a kangaroo court, um, that, that a sovereign country is not entitled to do that. I think it's, it's harder to make that argument. So that's just another theory. Um, but that's sort of the state of affairs as, as we see them in Xinjiang. Like, can I ask a, a, a follow-up just provoked by some of your comments here? Um, of course, we always hear China's not a monolith and that's a truism. It, it's yeah. of course true. Um, I wonder, just from your reporting and discussions and following this closely, do we know how much support there is for the repression campaign within uh, the PRC government and the party? I realize it's a very hard question to suss out, yeah. um, but but in the same way China's not a monolith, I'm sure policies are not supported monolithically. Yeah. Um, do we know, are there any contours of pushback, dissent, or frustration with this? I mean, anything I could say about this would be purely anecdotal, but like the really obvious example is the leaked documents that came to the to the New York Times, um, which were leaked by uh, a party official, I believe they, they said. So there has to be some level of dissent to have a leak of such significance and such importance. Um, come out about one of the most sensitive subjects um, in China. And just beyond that, like anecdotally, I just heard from, you know, Uyghur exiles and Kazakh exiles that I've met overseas that, you know, they like some of these people were in the party, like some of them were working in government positions and they've maintained contacts with like Han Chinese colleagues and friends and some of them will send information. They say privately, I think this is wrong, but then they can't actually do much about it. 
Um, but I think that the the kind of one aspect of it is the message control, but then also just the fact that it's really hard to get media out of Xinjiang, like um, audio files, video files and stuff like that because of the level of digital surveillance. I think that makes it really hard to tell like on kind of what what scale is this happening? Yeah, and Megan, just, just final question and, and then I'll give you a, a break, but I just wanted to, following up on your comment just now, I wanted to, you use some, some you know, um, old fashioned, uh, you know, reporting to do this this recent report, but you also had to, as, as I think, get around some of the restrictions on being able to travel to China. So yeah. just thinking about the piece that you did, um, how are we going to be able to assess progress or regress um, in in events in Xinjiang? Um, I mean, we're using satellite imagery to death. Is, is that really just? Are we? Is that the primary tool we're going to have to rely on moving forward? That. And, and reports from folks who have gotten out of the camps and across the border, or are there other tools uh, that are being developed or, or that we, we should be developing to be able to, to watch what's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I think satellite images are certainly one of the primary tools because our reporting was about the kind of evolution of this camp system. Um, it was a really good tool for us because we could sort of visually um, see the development of these camps. And um, our team is made up of an, a programmer called Christo Buschak and an architect, um, an investigator named Allison Killing. And like Allison was able to look at these buildings structurally and look at you know how many people could they hold like what kinds of rooms are these like what could these facilities be used for and we could really tell a surprising amount about what these compounds were just by looking at them but as far as other tools i think it's interesting because we've seen like throughout my time covering these like the the subject like there have been certain tools that have been useful and then become less useful and then people discover new tools like the really obvious one is procurement documents which used to be really easy to get in xinjiang and a lot of people did research um, notably Sean Zhang in, in Canada, a few other people, Adrian Zenz as well. Um, and then they stopped, they kind of uh, sh made it a lot harder to get those documents. But then now you still see, a, uh, like Adrian in particular has done a lot of research using just like government documents. Um, there's also the possibility of further leaks, I think, um, that could come out of this, especially if there are other conscientious objectors. Um, as far as tools that would be useful, I think like any internet internet circumvention tools um, are generally useful to people in situations like this. Like um, I've I've heard of a um, a lot of kind of organizations that develop these tools in places like North Korea and stuff like that. Um, I think it would be it would be a bit of an issue with distribution in Xinjiang because there are like spot checks of electronics and stuff like that. But um, I think like. For me as a reporter, like one of the primary issues is like, this is not a situation like, um, like for instance, like in Iraq or Syria or in, even in Myanmar, like places like that, where you have um, a human rights, uh, human rights atrocities, but you also have people uh, with a high level of kind of like um, tech literacy and like mobile phone ownership. You have a lot of like, images and videos and so you just have a lot of data coming out and Xinjiang has been like the opposite problem of that it's just like there's just so little that comes out that a lot of the reporting is really based on stuff that um, state media and other kind of government linked organizations have put out themselves um, and I think that's really the other piece of the puzzle is like what does this actually feel like on the ground to the people that have to experience it. Great thank you thank you very much Mega. Um... Sheena, I wanted to turn to you. Um, you've obviously been thinking about China's domestic security apparatus, its growth operations uh, for, for a long time. And of course, you wrote just absolutely fantastic article in international security, I think late last year on counterterrorism, counterterrorism prevention, preventative repression, China's changing strategy in Xinjiang, which really um, changed a lot of my thinking on what was the, the driving motivation here uh, behind the crackdown in Xinjiang. Um, I, when I was reading Megas' piece, one of the, the comment they got back from the Chinese government on this was uh, the issue of Xinjiang is about combating violent terrorism and separatism. Um, so that's how they're situating this. I don't, after reading your work, I don't think that's lip service. I think they fundamentally believe at, at, at heart this is a terrorism separatism issue. So I wanted to ask you, when we're thinking about Beijing's calculus, what may shift or may not shift Beijing's thinking, I wanted to, to ask you if you could walk us through your preventative repression framework insofar as what does it tell us about Beijing's calculations here? Um, and for folks who haven't, you know, who haven't spent the $8,000 subscribing to international security, um, you know, what is the you know, kind of basic argument that you're making? Because to me, at least, it was very important to understand 
the, the depth of, um, of focus and concern that Beijing has on the region. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, it's just, it's really a privilege to be part of such a terrific um, panel today of people whose work I really admire. Um, you know, the piece that you mentioned in international security, which I think is still ungated, if not anyone can contact me, I'll send you a copy, um, just to give them a little bit of credit for trying to put this out in the public realm, um, you know, talks about the fact that uh, China's policy in Xinjiang took what I would describe as a hard right turn in the spring of 2017. Um, and that followed a meeting of the Central National Security Commission which is this body that Xi Jinping set up in 2014, 2015, around the time that China released its first ever, or, or published, I'm sorry, internally, its first ever, ever national security strategy. Um, and so what I think we can see from the timing of that, uh, that shift in Xinjiang policy is that it's, it's really helpful to put it in the context of China's overall shift in how it treats and thinks about national security itself. And what we've seen in is that um, you know, Xi Jinping has articulated what I think is, is just a fundamentally different doctrine of national security. One of the key points about that is that it describes external and internal security threats as interlocking and mutually activated. And so the piece talks about that, you know, that doctrine as it was applied to Xinjiang where in the spring, you know, over the course of 2014, 15, 16, um, the party state gets appears to get really nervous about some contacts between members of the Uyghur diaspora in Southeast, with Islamic militant groups in Southeast Asia and in the Middle East and North Africa, particularly in Syria. And that the response is what we call pro in the piece preventive repression, the attempt to really inoculate the population from that kind of um, thinking seep or behavior seeping back into Xinjiang, a process of, of reverse diffusion um, of violence back into Xinjiang from abroad. Um, that, that can, the, the response by the Chinese political system is grossly disproportionate, right? There's, there's really no question about that. Um, multiple UN rapporteurs have, have signed on to that language. Um, and, um, and so I think, but I think it's, it's important to understand that because really what's at stake here is a manifestation or, or a, a piece of the, the fundamental way that the party thinks about political security. And Xi Jinping just um, made a, a speech or a set of remarks where he talked through 10 principles um, of, of national security, all of which build on and reinforce some of these same things, that this is a matter of regime security, that China views its internal and external security environment as exceptionally complicated, unprecedented in China's history. Um, and that the party has moved from the sort of more reactive language of stability maintenance to an ultra preventive approach um, of trying to prevent and control, or in this latest speech, the language was prevent and resolve um, potential challenges to, uh, to party control. And so, um, you know, the metaphor that gets used a lot in Xinjiang is a metaphor of immunization. And we take that metaphor seriously in part because I actually think it, it highlights sort of the core feature of the CCP's preventive approach, which is that it by definition requires that you target people who are engaged in otherwise innocuous activity, um, activity that would normally be considered typical religious practice, not a sign of extremism. Um, but if you take this metaphor of immunization seriously, you don't immunize people after exposure. In the age of COVID, we're all more used to thinking through this metaphor now, right? Um, in, in late 2020, but we you you only immunize people prior to exposure and 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 when they're healthy, um, and so the the implications of that for political inoculation in China's framework is is I think actually quite serious. Um, finally, I guess the the sort of the 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 conclusion of that. And you know the, the point that I wanted to raise with respect to, to Amy's really good report, um, you know, I, I would endorse a lot of the suggestions about a multilateral and multifaceted approach. Um, but I, you know, I was struck in reading it that the metaphors are the Soviet Union and apartheid South Africa. And um, in both of those cases, the cessation or lessening of human rights abuses. Um, was accompanied and in some cases really dependent on a pretty fundamental change in the nature of the ruling regime. 
And so the question is, if that's not what we're looking at, if that's not the pathway that Xinjiang and China itself are going to take, um, then I think we need to think about what are the alternatives. And the question I keep coming back to is, is are we looking at a North Korea scenario instead from a human rights standpoint? Are we looking at a, a case in which regime security, regime survival are at stake in the minds of the, the folks in Beijing um, and in Urumqi? Um, and if it's North Korea instead, um, you know, a state that's willing to bear immense costs um, without changing its behavior, or moderating its behavior, where does that leave us? Um, and I have a, a couple of thoughts about that. I know you're going to come back to us and talk about what can be done later. I'm happy to run through those briefly now, but I, I'm mindful that I've, I've talked for a little while. Um, so I can talk about those ideas now or, or I can um, pause. Yeah, maybe, maybe um, Sheena, maybe we'll just hold on those because I do want to have a lightning round uh, just at the very end with ideas. But I think the, the, the question you just framed is, is pretty profound because where you come down on that answer has a whole very significant set of implications for uh, companies, uh, democratic governments on the right posture to take. Obviously, with respect to North Korea, uh, we have essentially um, cut off all, all, all ties and, and we recognize we can't um, directly modulate human rights abuses internally, but we can do everything we can to essentially fully decouple um, um, from North Korea. So we'd have to be facing many of the same difficult choices if we come to the same um, or at least uh, uh, come down on that question uh, you just raised one way or the other. If I can, well, can give I, a- Can I just say, can I say one thing, just one more thing about that, that analogy? I think, you know, I think the, the issue is, you know, first of all, this is a new development in China, right? It was reasonable to try all of these tools and we haven't exhausted the toolkit yet as Amy's report, you know, makes really clear. Um, but I think, you know, we're now long enough into this, right? At least three years from that, that hard, three and a half years from past that hard right turn that I described. Um, there's been some real pressure applied. Um, it doesn't appear to be slowing um, many things down. There's an argument for not being complicit, which I want to return to because I think Amy's maybe made that point really well and it's a really important one with real implications. But I think we, you know, we do now with three and a half years of data and no change in course, I think we need to start talking about what if this is a much more durable um, and fundamental issue where China views its stakes as pretty darn high um, in terms of regime security and survival, um, then where does that leave us? And what do we realistically need to be looking at in terms of, of what policy options we have? My, my follow-up, Sheena, that I wanted to ask you based on your comments was, and, and either drawing from what you think would likely happen in China, or if you know of any other case studies, um, uh, taking China at face value about what's motivating the crackdown in Xinjiang and also taking at face value um, the, the um, impact that these policies both in and outside of the camps has had on a, on a generation of, of Uyghurs. What do you think Beijing sees as the, the, the end state here? Um, do they largely assess that this is a permanent architecture of surveillance and repression or do they fundamentally think they can do enough thought reform where five, 10 years down the road, they will have changed the mentality such that they can start unwinding the camps or is there some, in, or is there some shading in, in between those that they're aiming for? I think it's in the middle, but I think it's a calculus that they see as, as likely to change over time. And um, and so I guess, you know, I would say in the, the short term, right, the numbers that we're seeing, the estimate was that 20 to 30 percent of people in Xinjiang had problematic thinking. And the estimates of people who've gone into the camps actually tracks relatively well with that. Um, it, you know, so in some sense, this is what we're seeing is consistent with with some of the internal and external rhetoric of the, the CCP. Um, I want to be really clear that that when I say you know we take the counterterrorism definition seriously, that doesn't mean sort of accepting it the logic or the the policy implications at face value, right? Um, I can accept that that there's a very deep sort of security fear that is motivating the regime, while also thinking that it is the fear is both you know an inaccurate assessment of the threat and that the policies they're pursuing are likely to make it worse, um, both of which I think are the case. Um, but I learned from writing my first book that dictators' threat perceptions are, are often not sort of in accordance with objective reality as, as outsiders would assess it. Um, you know, I see the strategy as a couple of things. One, I think the CCP does place a higher value on thought work and 
um, ideological work and, and ideological education um, than Western audiences do, right? We, you know, patriotic education since 1989 has been a huge part of the Chinese political system and the educational system. Um, so I, you know, I think, I think their estimates of the efficacy of that are probably higher than you or I might, might assign a baseline probability of success. Um, but the second thing, and this is part of why, I, you know, I say, what if we're moving more toward a North Korea end state is that one of the things we've seen, right, is the construction and Jessica's work on this is, is really fantastic, right? Um, and, and some of the work Mega's done on surveillance in Xinjiang and among the diaspora um, is, you know, that there are parts of Xinjiang where there are now residential zones where surveillance is, is quite tight. Um, and that actually reminds me of some of the areas of North Korea where people might, um, there are the sort of the most intense camps, but there are also zones of residential control. Um, and an extraordinary surveillance state, right? And so what we're seeing in Xinjiang is this effort to rapidly not only catch Xinjiang up in terms of its surveillance state, but really kind of leapfrog where Eastern China was, you know, has been at in terms of surveillance. Um, and so to the extent that you can really strengthen the surveillance architecture, you know, then it becomes safer to release people from sort of a full on prison type facility like Mega's work is, you know, her most recent piece is described to one of these zones of, of residential control um, where you can really keep track of people's movements and behavior um, without necessarily having to sort of imprison them in a single building, if that makes sense. And I, so I see, I see that hybrid and that shift as part of the, end, the probable end state. Thanks, Sheena. Um, Jessica, I wanted to turn to you. Um, you've been doing for uh, uh, some just really fantastic work. Uh, one of your recent pieces on using, you know, Meg had mentioned use of procurement documents in Xinjiang. You've been looking at a set, a large set of, of procurement documents to be to begin looking at um, the contribution, if you can use that word, of, of private firms, of companies, of SOEs, of other commercial entities towards um, the thick ecosystem of technologically and surveillance um, throughout China. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you've also been tracking Xinjiang very, very closely. I wanted to turn to you to understand the, the economic uh, motivators, drivers, and actors here. Um, how integral is the private sector in the campaign of repression? Obviously, there's been targeting of uh, of, of companies here for their direct involvement and indirect involvement. Amy's work has been looking at, at, at the role of supply chain. So I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, um, uh, on this sort of economic angle uh, in Xinjiang. How, how important is it? And of course, the, the question lingering over that is, is where are there pressure points um, that, that uh, governments can be pushing on to try and modulate the, the trend lines? Thanks, and thanks so much for, for having me here. Um, I, I think that, you know, Sheena's diagnosis in terms of viewing it as a super preventative um, framework is correct. So I don't want to start off by saying this is driven by economic considerations, first and foremost. It's driven by the security mindset, first and foremost. Um, but you know, as you said, the, pri the private sector is crucial in this, right? And it is a big money maker for some of these people who have opportunities to, to develop and sell products to the government to deploy in, in Xinjiang, right? Um, but I also think it's really important to look at this in the China context where, you know, these companies don't have to hide what they're doing. There's a, and one of the things we haven't really talked about today yet is the broader acceptance um, outside of Xinjiang of, of, of what's happening in Xinjiang to the extent that people are know or care as, as much as we can tell without having direct access to a poll or independent polling or something, you know, most of Chinese society seems okay with what's going on there. So like, not only is this profitable for those companies, but they're not paying any sort of countervailing price domestically for participating in this. Um, and, you know, it's not uncommon for that technology for some of those technologies to be used elsewhere in China, that's what our recent report was looking at, right? That Xinjiang is an outlier in terms of the population that's being targeted and how much of um, the Xinjiang population is a target. Uh, but you know, some of the technologies, a lot of the technologies are, are the same throughout China. And I think it's also important to remember that you know, it's not uncommon generally for uh, private sector businesses to be selling surveillance or other sort of technology equipment to governments, right? That happens here all the time. Um, so, 
it's a it's a complicated mix where it is a big cash cow. These companies are critical for the Chinese government to achieve their aims because the CCP doesn't, as far as I know, doesn't have some amazing in-house tech lab where they're developing like the latest <laughs> genetic uh, uh, assess, assessing tools or anything. Um, but you know, in some ways, the private sector plays a role similar to what it does elsewhere. Um, the way I like to think about this is, is not just a whole of government approach, but kind of like a whole of society approach where the Chinese government is using all the tools at its at, at its disposal, right? So it's not just the camps, it's this it's the formal legal and prison system as Mega was talking about. It's the business sector. Um, it's trying to cover all public spaces, trying to cover all private spaces. And like a lot of the way that you can do that is because there's not a ton of pushback from, from other people in society. Um, Thinking about this internationally, one of the things that we found when we were doing our research was that it's really hard for some companies to know, international companies to know um, if their tech, what their tech is being used for in China, if it gets bought and then how it's being deployed in China, right? So one of the things that became really clear from the procurement documents is that uh, it's middlemen companies that do it, are doing a lot of the buying from you know, international companies and then selling it to local governments, perhaps even doing the deployment of it. So um, there's not necessarily a direct interface between some tech company and, you know, the police in Xinjiang when they get this equipment. Um, so I do think that the work Amy's doing right now is actually really important for us to be thinking about frameworks that the, con that the commercial sector internationally should be putting in place to avoid complicity in some of these things. And I thought the report last month about um, isotope testing was brilliant, right? This is this is one way around the problem of we don't have access um, and how can we start trying to take steps to avoid complicity? And if I can just really quickly get at one question that you um, asked Sheena, I just add on to her answer about what is like the desired end state, you know, are you gonna be permanently securitized or what? Um, I think also it's a, it's a timeline issue, right? If the goal, if the goal is to break generational transmission of culture, um, and if you can do that, then you don't need to continually watch people forever and ever if they've been completely deculturated in that way. So I think um, we just need to think about it as opposed to a couple years of time scale as, as like a generational time scale. Great, thank, thank you, Jessica. Actually, I, I wanted to do a round robin at the end before I turn it over to Amy, but Jessica, why don't I just stay with you? Um, and, and by the way, I very much appreciate folks who have been sending in questions, um, such as the kind of the quality of analysis here um, that we just, we'll, I'll try and fit some of these in, but but um, um, this has been so fruitful to hear from our, our guests. Um, but um, I, I'll just gonna uh, pose a couple of the questions that have been asked more generically. And then um, Jessica, I wanted to go to you, uh, then go to Sheena, then go to Mega to ask a this kind of final question of, um, um, what do you see as um, tools um, that, that are most likely to have uh, an effect here, kind of summing this up? We've, we've talked a lot about the calculus that Beijing has here. Um, as the Biden administration and other governments begin thinking about what's next, I think also thinking about Amy's, um, Amy's report, um, where, where are we likely to see a, sh a shift in Beijing's behavior and, and what would be the things that would, would get there? Um, a, a great question, which was asked much earlier on, and I, and I suspect building off of Amy's comment on the fact that most of the cotton is consumed domestically in China. Uh, a question is, China's economy uh, may transition to becoming less export dependent. Would even the most effectively structured multilateral sanctions be effective? Um, do we need to use or develop other tools? Of course, um, you know, folks who follow Beijing's new dual circulation economic strategy see that they're trying to um, uh, I think uh, leverage their domestic market uh, control, capture more of the value there, limit some of their exposure on trade. I don't think that's driven by concerns over Xinjiang, but certainly th this question I think astutely pinpoints that um, nonetheless, the side effect of that will be as China is less trade dependent, some of the, the tools that we have may be less meaningful. Of course, China is sick to death of US sanctions across the board and is looking wherever it can at the margin to, to uh, blunt the impact of those, whether that's about thinking about ways to, to move off of US dollar dependency, that way um, uh, sanctions don't quite have as much bite, uh, thinking about um, uh, stopping at the margin using or uh, uh, financial institutions that uh, 
uh, that have to abide by U.S. sanctions. So I think that that's a really good question that's forward looking at a much more dynamic environment where maybe U.S. power in the international financial system isn't as uh, as impressive as it was as is now or was, let's say, five or 10 years ago. Um, and uh, also just a couple questions here, um, thinking about some of the some of the actions that are currently before Congress. Um, ex including some of the ones to uh, cut off all uh, all purchases uh, from goods in Xinjiang under the presumption that if we can't uh, declaratively state that this is not made with forced labor, then we should move to a, a complete um, renunciation uh, of, of uh, importing uh, those goods. So, so those are some of the questions that are, that are being asked. So Jessica, uh, just um, Final thoughts here on, um, I don't want to make this a normative statement of what you support, but just as an analyst of China's political situation, what actions may may have an impact? I'm really, it's really unfortunate I'm going first because I feel like this is all the hard work Amy has done and I'm going to basically say I don't have a great answer. So um, yeah, I, I guess what I'll say is number one, just backing up slightly and again, going back to, to Sheena's really astute statement that this is about a security mindset. This is viewed by Beijing as an existential threat. And I'm, I think that that's a really important first place to start when thinking about any steps that we can take that might or might not be effective, right? Because I think, you know, from my time in government, I feel like this was starting to fade, but it was still there, was this idea that if we can just convince them that it's in their interest to be nice to people, right, to treat people well, then they won't have to worry about people being separatists. Um, and I think that the time has passed for us to be trying to deal logically in that way, uh, because I think it's really clear that that's, that's not effective. And um, they, they have decided what the logical conclusion here is. So um, that said, that makes us a really, really tough problem because what amount of pain are they willing to tolerate for something that they consider an actual existential threat, like a threat to the regime's survival? Um, I think that we can be doing, I, I think that um, Amy's right, there are a number of moral steps that can and should be taken, whether or not that they are effective. Um, I do think that uh, we have really missed a lot of opportunities in the last four years to be working multilaterally, again, as Amy said. And I think that some of the steps that we take shouldn't just be seen as um, signals to China, but they should be seen as signals to potential allies. Right. Again, thinking about countries that are not the usual suspects in terms of joining statements on China or whatever, um, we need to be able to signal ourselves as the US and, and jointly as other countries that we are going to be there where this is going to be a continued issue. I think part of the problem is that we haven't shown a serious, consistent commitment to this over time. But in terms of specific steps, which I think are going to be effective, I will leave to Amy and <laughs> others for their, their brilliance. Um, th thank you very much. Uh uh, Jessica, I appreciate that. Um, and um, just uh, want to, uh, Sophie Richardson, who uh, just has a, a good comment here um, on just hope the idea of investigations and accountability proceedings do not fade. Human rights crimes of this scope and scale merit such a response and Chinese authorities are not entitled to, to impunity. Um, so e even if um, I think we recognize there's not a silver bullet, um, um, I, I think signaling uh, resolve in these issues. And the other thing I think is for, for signaling to other would-be human rights violators that, that the uh, international community still cares deeply about these, even if we haven't um, been able to quote solve the, the issue in China. Um, uh, uh, Sheena, can I go to you then? Mega, go to you. Just looking at the clock, um, I hate to do this, but if, if just a, a, maybe a couple minutes each, I wanna save uh, robust time for, for Amy to sum things up. So Sheena, over to you, any thoughts on, on uh, next steps? A couple of concrete ideas here. Um, I mean, first, I think it is really important that the United States continue to emphasize and try to get multilateral emphasis on the fact that it is clear that China's behavior by its own logic and its own metaphors and, and discourse is targeting people who have not engaged in criminal uh, or terrorist behavior. I think I think that needs to be you know really clear front and center. I've said publicly that I have some concerns about trying to boil it down to this, it's not counterterrorism statement. Part of that is that I think that actually puts Beijing in, in a position of potentially having the upper hand 
in its own domestic propaganda, where then it can show footage of the Kunming train station attack on repeat and build support by, by sort of fomenting fear among um, a Han majority, many of whom are really unfamiliar with Xinjiang. Um, but the other issue is that I think it creates, you know, the United States saying it's not counterterrorism at all, makes it much harder for us to work with third countries who may be concerned about um, very, very small, admittedly, numbers of folks who are leaving China, but who've made contact with Islamic State or Al Qaeda affiliated groups or other Islamic groups elsewhere, whether that's Southeast Asia, the Middle East, or North Africa. Um, you know, those are often states with significant Muslim populations. And uh, you know, as as Amy has I think pointed out at the beginning, right? China has is very effectively sort of tried to keep those states on board with its its actions in places like UN fora. Um, and so I think if we're going to start trying to split those countries away from support for what China is doing, um, a more nuanced discussion of you know, what the security challenges are um, may open up some avenues for partnership with some of these third states. Some of them are authoritarian, some of them it's not going to work very well, but we need, a, I think, a more differentiated um, approach to try to start splitting the international coalition that China has assembled in favor of what it's doing. Um, brings me to my second comment or second idea. Um, which is that, you know, I think some of these unilateral measures are important. As Amy said, it's important for us simply not to be complicit, right? In um, one of the reasons, I remember one of my old advisors saying, one of the reasons we don't torture is it's bad for any number of reasons, but we don't want to turn ourselves into torturers, right? Um, and so this is about sort of who we are and not being complicit. And, and I think that is an important point. Um, but also to Sophie's point, right? Um, if we're going to talk about international coalitions and multilateralism, I think the, U the US may want to consider, perhaps in combination with, with the EU or some other like-minded countries, potentially pushing for a, a, a UN Commission of Inquiry. Right, one was done in the case of North Korea. The language that, it, that the panel concluded with was crimes against humanity without parallel in the contemporary world. Right, um, and that's a really important finding um, because it was the United Nations, it was the international community. Um, and so, yes, I anticipate there are gonna be all sorts of difficulties with the US having made itself absent from the Human Rights Council, China being more active, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? And I, I think it's, it's worth seriously thinking about that as a method of building an international coalition and consensus on what's happening as well as, you know, sort of the scale or magnitude of the, the moral issues at stake. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the, uh, the third thing then is refugee and asylum policy, right? If this is a North Korea scenario and we're going to be looking at abuses on a large scale, um, potential crimes against humanity in Xinjiang for the long term, then what are our obligations in terms of refugee and asylum determinations and, and incorporating that into our um, policies. That's a question for the United States to consider, particularly under an administration that's indicated it's going to raise, re-raise the refugee cap. But it's also an issue, I think, for the broader, you know, global human rights and refugee resettlement um, regime to, to think about. Um, so those are the concrete places I'd start in addition to some of the, the ideas that are in the report itself. Thanks. Great, Gina. Thank you so much. Uh, Meg, uh, a final panelist, panelist word to you. Just, just flagging, we just got a couple minutes left. Sorry to crunch you up against the end here, um, but uh, no just wanted, thanks. I'll just keep it super short. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I don't have like great concrete ideas like um, my fellow panelists, but I would say the thing I think is really important, uh, which Jessica has pointed out, is that we have to think of this on the same time scale as them. And I do think that um, this is a generational time scale, like this campaign. I totally agree with that point. This is why you have, um, you know, the abolition of Uyghur and Kazakh language education. This is why you have, um, you know, orphanages uh, teaching children in, in Chinese and teaching them um, sort of history and politics from the government's perspective. Um, I think we have to keep that in mind. And then most of the the mo most of the kind of uh, really forceful measures on Xinjiang have come out of the US and they've come in the last year and a half. 
And given the, the kind of uh, the lag that we have in finding out the most current information about what's happening in the region because of the time it takes for people to leave and, and so forth and for journalists and researchers to do this kind of work, like it's, it's very, very early to start to say things about whether measures like sanctions, uh, like export bans, um, policy measures like these are, are having an effect or, or not. And that's something that I'll be really interested to see in the next kind of like two years. Great, thank, thank you, Mega. Um, Amy, uh, uh, sorry to put you right up against the, the back of the event, uh, but such was the richness of, of the discussion here. Um, so I, I think we could probably spill a minute or so over, but just wanted to turn it over to you for any, any final comments or summing up remarks. I'll try to be pretty quick. This may not sum anything up elegantly, but um, first, Mega, thank you for you know being a little more optimistic. I think sometimes that's needed. That like to remind ourselves that you know any challenge like this, like like let's take apartheid. Like it took years to dismantle, even after the international community actually started working on it. So I think you know this situation in Xinjiang is so awful. You want to see immediate change, but maybe that's not realistic. Um, and I thought that Sheena's comments about North. Korea are both very depressing to think about. Um, I feel like we do still have a lot of tools to deploy and frankly, our allies and friends could do a lot more. So there's a lot of opportunity. I did want to pick up the accountability piece. I just was running out of time. So I, we, but we talk in the report about the role of the UN, the things that have been done and not done. The High Commissioner on Human Rights has asked for access to the region, but hasn't been denied the kind of access she'd need, uh, hasn't been provided with it. Um, but there have been situations where, maybe to Sheena's point, where the UN and also the High Commissioner have, have done reports without direct access to the region. They did that um, with Kashmir as well. So there are ways, if they can get the data points, to start putting that together. And I think that ties into the refugee issue um, in the sense that there are lots of reasons we should be helping refugees from Xinjiang and, and other places. Um, but one of the challenges is like, it's just so hard to get people to talk about their experiences because they're very afraid, especially in the Uyghur community. And so if we could provide them a safe place to be, I also think we would be able to get a better understanding of what's happening and be able to use that more effectively um, globally. It's a real challenge in my experience uh, in this particular situation. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I really felt like I needed to say. Um, one other, I think, interesting issue that I haven't seen much done on, um, but I think could be quite interesting. So I'm flagging this for the, the journalists and others on this team, uh, on this panel, is just the role of US venture capital, uh, especially in the tech space, and trying to understand that. There's like no regulation of that and no ability to, like the government, the US government has very few tools. Um, they don't report to the SEC, like there's no real regulator. So just want to flag that. I think I'll stop there because I know we're basically over time, but that was a fantastic panel. I still feel like we have a long ways to go trying to figure out some of these issues, but uh, it was a great discussion. Uh, great. Th thank you, um, Amy, uh, for your for your work and for the report. And I just want to thank again our, um, our, our three guests for taking time out um, to discuss this important issue. Also three you know, uh, analysts, scholars, journalists who are just really doing some of the best work helping us outside um, uh, Xinjiang understand what's what's happening here, the underlying uh, governing rationale, uh, the, the developments um, on the ground. Um, and so really applaud the three of you and, and appreciate your time and effort. Thanks to the audience uh, for participating. I know there's lots of Zoom options uh, nowadays. And so I think it's a testament to um, the importance that many people attach to this issue that everyone has, has joined. And obviously the takeaway here is this is a really vexing issue um, that, that, that does not allow for clean, neat solutions. Uh, and we don't have the toolkit immediately in front of us, but it also sounds, and I take away from Amy's work and some of the comments here that uh, perfect is the enemy of the good and that there are actions that democratic governments can be taking now uh, whether as a sign of resolve um, or, uh, you know, China's uh, comment, I think so, what some other have said, um, opening up our borders to refugees to be able to, um, to to come to the United States and other democratic countries, sort of putting our money where our mouth is, um, is uh, is a step that that U.S. and other countries could take. So um, to be continued. Uh, thanks to everyone again, and uh, for those who want to share this uh, afterward, th this discussion will be up on the CSIS YouTube channel. Um, within the next day or so. And of course, immediately go to CSS.org uh, 
and uh, and you'll see Amy's report there front and center, combating human rights abuses in, in Xinjiang. So thanks everyone, um, have a good week and uh, happy holidays.